Lockheed L-133 was a very, very ambitious design for the time frame we're talking about in this video. Design work started back in 1939, and the end result had a lot more in common with more modern aircraft than the planes of the time. They were supposed to have a crew of one, a length of 48 feet 4 inches, a wingspan of 46 feet 8 inches, a wing area of 325 square feet, and they were to be powered by two Lockheed L-1000 axial flow turbojets, capable of delivering 5,100 pounds of force each. Lockheed's engineers estimated a top speed of 625 miles per hour, and they were supposed to be armed with four 20mm nose-mounted cannons. The L-133, which is sometimes known as the Starjet, was distinctive to say the least, but in the end, this particular plane would never actually be produced at all. There wouldn't even be a prototype for it. Why not? Lockheed was actually the first aviation company, in the United States anyway, to start work on jet-powered aircraft. They tinkered around with their own L-1000 turbojet engine, but nothing much came of that particular model. It was allowed to languish due to focuses elsewhere on more conventional aircraft, and by the time it was ready, other turbojets had surpassed it. But at the time, Lockheed was still interested in possibly getting a military contract to produce a plane powered by jets. It was a paper project that involved engineers Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, Willis M. Hawkins, as well as Hall L. Hibbard. And by 1940, the preliminary work on a company-financed jet fighter had actually been started, which ultimately had several different versions drawn up. The final submitted proposed design was unlike any other plane the company had submitted before. It featured the jet engines held internally in a side-by-side -side arrangement that would help maximize thrust output, as well as reliability and straight-line performance. The control surfaces were meant to be hydraulically assisted due to how fast the plane was supposed to be. It would utilize steel in the construction, and the undercarriage would be a modern, fully retractable wheeled tricycle system. The aircraft also had a blended wing body configuration. This setup featured the wing main planes well aft, with canard four planes added for stabilization as well as additional control surfaces at the front. The intake for the jets would be nose mounted. The tail wouldn't have any horizontal planes at all, since the forward canards worked well for that already. The aircraft would just have a single vertical fin instead. The cockpit also had a simple two-piece canopy, which presented strong forward and side views for the pilot. The L-1000 engines were in themselves pretty ambitious for the time frame. They were multi-stage, axial flow. They were originally meant just to showcase integrated intercoolers, which, as the name implies, were meant to help cool the engine down. But the finalized proposal didn't actually have those at all. As you can tell, the overall proposal was very, very strange for that time. But it was very forward-thinking. A lot of these elements would be seen in future fighters, but as I said, it was never built. Why was the L-133 never constructed? After all, Lockheed clearly was pushing the envelope here, and wouldn't the military want a super-advanced fighter for World War II? And yes, but, well, Lockheed did officially submit the proposal to the U.S. Army Air Forces for consideration on March 30th, 1942. They said no. The reason they said no was actually quite unique. It wasn't that they thought it couldn't work. It was that it was too much of a good thing. The design was too advanced, too futuristic, not nearly in line with what they were currently looking for at that point. Yes, they were looking for advanced fighter aircraft, sure, but this was... No, no, not, not that's too far. I mean, this would be expensive even in the modern day. Back then, nothing like it had ever been tried before, while military funding was very high due to World War II, this kind of project would take a ton of, well, money, resources, and time that they just did not have, particularly the time estimate. There were plenty more conservative proposals that did offer superior performance to enemy aircraft, while at the same time being able to hit the battlefield very quickly. The Starjet, as impressive a concept as it was, would have taken years to actually be ready in a mass-produced form, 
and the army didn't have years to mess about with this. And with their rejection came the cancellation of any further work on the project, with Lockheed going off and focusing on improvements to some of their more conservative designs, like the Lightning. But in the end, Lockheed would still produce a jet, just not this one. Lockheed would be responsible for the United States Army Air Force's first operational jet fighter, the P-80 Shooting Star. And the Shooting Star kind of demonstrates why the L-133 probably never would have seen combat during the war, because the Shooting Star didn't either, despite the fact that it is a much more conservative design. They only saw very limited service in Italy just before the war ended. They wouldn't actually see combat until the Korean War. But the Shooting Star did significantly benefit from the L-133 project. Lockheed's engineers learned a lot about jet working on the Star Jet, and applied all of that into the Shooting Star, which again was a much more Baby Steps design. It wasn't pushing the envelope too hard, it just made jets work, and succeeded at that. They are in themselves their own story though, and if you want to hear more about that, maybe I'll make a video about them next week. Let me know what you think in the comments down below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe because I'm supposed to ask even though I forget every time. It, it's just a button click. It's not hard. Just, just, just hit the button. Please? Please? Or don't. It's fine. Either way, have a nice day. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Road Videos, Lord Off 444, A Person 723, Royal Hudson 2860, Icer 41405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues, Greyhounds, Love, Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Braid Waters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Mr. Slippy, Travis Selinski, Jared Brussel, Joshua Long, Hannah Bird, Amtrak 2024 Productions, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Mark Holding, Dr. Razor78, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Liam Wright, Hayden DeGrow, Metal for Life Guy, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.